Welcome to Greybeard's Jewels. Step into the unknown. Episode 4 The Chattelowuk Civilization. Long before we lived in sophisticated cities, people of the world lived largely nomadic lives. They followed their food sources, chased the seasons, and packed their lives upon their persons and moved on to the next place they would call home. Sometime around 8000 BC, however, the way people lived changed. They started staying in one place for longer stretches of time. They carved out a life from the very land around them. They planted crops, raised animals, and formed communities. One of the very best preserved of these first communities is Chetaloyuk, an ancient civilization unearthed in the Anatola region of Turkey. Not only is this site of such significance for the discovery of a Neolithic civilization, but for the secrets it holds to a society full of mystery and oddities, complete lack of streets, paths, and public spaces, large collections of strange clay balls, and dead bodies tucked in spaces right below their hearths, beds, and spaces the living carried out the business of daily life. Kataloyuk sits in central Turkey, southeast of the modern city of Kanya, Anatola refers to the peninsula of land that today constitutes the Asian portion of Turkey. It's bound by the north by the Black Sea, to the east and southeast by the southeastern Taurus Mountains and the Mediterranean Sea, and to the west by the Algean Sea and the Sea of Marmara. Its unique position at the point where the continents of Asia and Europe meet means that this region has long been a crossroads for people of many civilizations, but at a time when other people were still hunting, gathering, and living in cave dwellings, the community of Chattelowuk was carving out a life in the land they chose to remain in permanently. As the earliest example of Neolithic life, the Chattelowuk holds plenty of answers to questions we have about this time in our world history, but many mysteries too. The Chattelowuk, named after the two mounds at Restween, was discovered and excavated by James Mallard in 1958. Mallard himself is a bit of a mystery. This London-born James grew up in the Netherlands before returning to England to earn his degree in Egyptology from the University College London. He went on to focus extensively on archaeology projects in Turkey and was well known for his extraordinary ability to spot almost invisible sites that others had missed. He worked on the Jericho excavations and uncovered the Shalfolithic site of Haklar. A mere two years later he discovered the Neolithic date of a large mound in the Kanya plain called Jetaloyuk. His project uncovered 18 successful layers of buildings. The bottom layer dated from as early as 7100 BC, while the top layer is dated from 5600 BC. This incredible discovery was unlike anything historians, archaeologists, and anthropologists had ever seen. Millard's work was stopped after he was banned from Turkey for his involvement in the Dorok affair, in which he published drawings of supposedly important Bronze Age artifacts that later went missing. Millard claims the artifacts were shown to him at a home in Izmar, and lacking a camera, he sketched them, but the investigation never uncovered the supposed homeowner or even the home itself. Millard was accused of smuggling the items out of Turkey and selling them on the black market. After Millard's expulsion from Turkey, the site lay idle until 1993, when investigations began under Ayn Holder, a former student of Millard. It quickly became and remains one of the most ambitious excavations ever undertaken, and his findings are nothing short of fascinating, mystifying, and chilling. While other sites from this time period found around the globe feature distinct separate family dwellings and public spaces, the site at Chattelowuk is unique in its oddity. The mud brick dwellings are crammed side by side in large honeycomb-like clusters, there is no evidence of streets, alleyways, or even simple footpaths between the dwellings. Instead, the buildings were accessed from their roofs, through holes in the ceilings, or from doors reached by ladders or stairs. All signs pointed to Chattelowuk using the rooftops as their streets, meeting places, and business centers. Inside the dwellings, ornate murals were found in some spaces, and the rooms were shockingly, scrupulously clean. There is very little rubbish to be found in the site, and waste was carefully and skillfully disposed of. 
What kept the chattel Oyuk off the ground? Why build your life on the rooftops? There are, of course, some theories as to why. A simple explanation was that it was safer. The town, unlike others from the same region, had no walls around it. Instead, the people may have relied on the walls of their actual dwellings to serve as their only defense. Therefore, having no doors or entrances at ground level made them more secure. Other people speculate that the town's population grew at such an alarming rate that building right on top of each other was the most efficient way to gain living space quickly. The rooftop society of Chattaloyu was amazingly egalitarian and gender equal. Evidence suggests that men and women shared equal status, with each receiving the same nutrition and social status as male members of the community. Children observed the domestic areas, learning and completing tasks like repairs and performing rituals. Likewise, the honeycomb housing structures led experts to believe the Chattaloyuk people relied heavily on their neighbors and worked closely together to ensure success of the community. Large communal ovens were found on the rooftops and while some people seem to have personal belongings, there is a greater abundance of shared supplies. The site is divided into two clear living areas, separated by a gully. With the utter absence of any nearby settlements, some historians speculate, the divide marks two kinship groups, which allowed for marriages between the separate groups. This remarkable step in careful procreation explains how such an early settlement was able to grow to nearly 10,000 people. From the art discovered at the site, Mellart posited that the Chattaloyuk worshipped a female deity. A particularly well-preserved carved figure depicts a large female from seated on a throne between two leopards. Despite Mellart's theories, Ian Hodder claims that his discoveries since taking over the site no longer support this position. He says that males and females are represented equally through the religious art and iconography leading him to believe that the society was neither patriarchal nor matriarchal. This finding is supported in the other evidence of a surprisingly equal existence of both sexes. Another perplexing find at Chattaloyuk was the presence of hundreds of thousands of clay balls all over the excavation site, made of fired clay and ranging in size from pea-like to baseball size. The balls are a source of debate among archaeologists some think the clay balls could be used for counting, while others claim the strange markings on them represent a barter system. Yet others posit that the balls were simply crude weapons, an easy thing to lob at any approaching threats. Another theory cites the evidence of ash and charcoal on many of the balls to mean that they were likely used in cooking, perhaps to draw toxins out of the prepared foods, or perhaps to heat food more efficiently. The balls appear to be made by hand, some very crudely, with visible fingerprints and nail prints embedded into the fire clay. But the mystery of the Chattaloya clay balls remains. Were all the clay balls found used for the same purpose? Or was the shape and material simply handy for multi-uses? Tiny clay marbles for toys and larger ones for weapons. Medium-sized ones to boil water. Or were they an extensive arsenal for defense of a wallless town? Perhaps most mystifying about the Chattaloyuk is their rituals around death. The Chattaloyuk did not remove dead bodies to a separate burial place. Instead, they kept their dead within the village, but in the village that has no outdoor ground level spaces. There was only one place to keep the dead, beneath the very feet of the living. Archaeologists discover human remains in pits beneath the floors of the dwellings and in some cases, bodies were kept under platforms in the main rooms and even under beds and hearths. The Chattaloyuk prepared their dead for these resting places by tightly flexing their bodies and placing them in the baskets or wrapping them in reed mats. Burial pits below the platforms of the homes were used again and again. After a body was placed inside, the pit was filled with clay and the opening sealed with plaster. The Chattaloyuks would then coat the platforms with a fresh layer of plaster and continue sleeping on it. When the time came to add another burial, it was opened again, cleared of earth, and the bones of the previous burial pushed aside to make room for the newcomer. Few adults were buried with any goods, 
but it wasn't uncommon for the bodies of children to be found buried with long strands of small, polished beads made of stone, shell, or coral. Prior to this discovery, such a burial practice was unheard of. Most ancient civilizations exhibit clear burial spaces. Think of the pyramids of ancient Egypt, funeral pyres of the Norse, the cremation rituals of Buddhist East Asia, even the earliest known burial site, at Kwafza in Israel, shows bodies buried in coffins in a cave. Will we ever uncover the secret of why the Chataloyuk kept their dead within their homes? Among the remains discovered at Chataloyuk, there are some that are more mysterious than others. There are a few skulls with evidence of Alkri, leaving anthropologists to believe that they painted the skulls before burial to resemble faces a ritual observed in other settlements in the Neolithic period. But they couldn't explain why 14 bodies were buried without their heads. Most of the time, corpses discovered in Chataloyuk bore the signs of defleshing, the removal of organs and skin before burial in the form of knife marks. But the 14 headless corpses didn't show any signs of knife marks, but were still defleshed. So how were these 14 headless bodies stripped of their skin? Some hypothesize that the remains are linked to the symbols of the griffin vultures found in many spaces in Chataloyuk. A team of archaeologists now believe that the Chataloyuk people may have preferred the rooftops as a burial preparation site, in addition to its many other uses. Bodies could be laid on the roofs in plain view of the vultures, while remaining safe from terrestrial carnivores. Griffin vultures are surprisingly skillful at fully dismantling all the fleshy parts of a corp while leaving the tendons intact, allowing the bodies to be wrapped in a tight bundle after the defleshing was completed. If the potential evidence of using carrion birds in a burial ritual is true, it makes Chataloyuk the earliest site on earth known to engage in such a practice. But wait, are you still wondering what happened to those 14 heads? I am too. Though the archaeologists have explained the differences in the remainder of the corpses, they have yet to discover just exactly where those skulls went or why. The artifacts left behind by the Chataloyuk people continue to capture our imaginations today. Perhaps the biggest mystery of all is where the Chataloyuk went and why. What makes a community of nearly 10,000 members move on after building their homes and lives 18 layers high? Archaeologists are conflicted on answers to that conundrum, too. Some theorize that climate change drove them away. Perhaps their constant digging of mud altered the course and flow of the river. Others point to the discovery of head wounds on many of the skulls to speculate that after generations of egalitarian society, generational wealth inheritance led to deep conflicts and violence. Others consider the possibility the strict rules that made the society function for so long were no longer appealing to newer generations, who abandoned the bizarre honeycombs in search of new ways of life. Will we ever know for sure who the Chataloyuk were? What they valued, worshipped, or feared? Perhaps not, but as I sit tonight and glance around my own dwelling, I must wonder if thousands of years from now, Researchers will struggle to find the same answers about us. Thanks for listening to Greybeard's Jewels. Step into the unknown. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe to the podcast on Spotify or wherever you like to listen. Research and writing for this episode were done by Katie from the Reference Desk. If you're interested in these services, please see our show notes for links. Thank you for your support.